welcome to today's On This Day in Tudor History with me, Claire Ridgway. I'm the author of several Tudor history books and I also run the Tudor Society and the Anne Boleyn Files website. Okay, I'm taking you back into Henry VIII's reign today. For On This Day in Tudor History, the 9th of July, 1540, the marriage of King Henry VIII and his fourth wife, Anne of Cleves, was declared null and void. Now, the couple had been married just six months. Convocation ruled that the marriage of 49-year-old Henry VIII and 24-year-old Anne of Cleves was found null on three different grounds. One, that there was already a pre-contract between Anne and the Duke of Lorraine, which was said to be a binding contract which could not be undone. Two, that the marriage was unwillingly entered into, on Henry's side anyway. And three, that the marriage had never been consummated. It was claimed that the king had decided to postpone consummation until he was sure that the pre-contract had been discharged. Convocation declared that both Henry and Anne were free to marry again if they so wished. And of course, King Henry VIII had a new bride waiting in the wings, the 17 to 18 year old Catherine Howard, who had served Anne of Cleves as one of her ladies. And he would marry her very soon on the 28th of July, 1540. Anne, on the other hand, still considered herself married to the king and she never remarried when Catherine Howard fell in 1541 and was executed in February 1542, Anne of Cleves assumed that the king would return to her and was obviously very disappointed when that didn't happen. It was not meant to be. Now, the legal proceedings into the annulment of Henry VIII's fourth marriage had begun on the 29th of June 1540 and had involved investigations into Anne's former pre-contract with the Duke of Lorraine and also Henry VIII's claim that he'd not had sexual relations with his bride. Sir John Wallop, who was Henry's ambassador in France, was instructed to talk to the Cardinal of Lorraine, the Duke of Lorraine's uncle, regarding this pre-contract, while Richard Pate was sent to inform Emperor Charles V of the proceedings. The Countess of Rutland, Lady Rochford and Lady Edgecombe, who were all ladies of Anne's privy chamber, were questioned about what Anne had said regarding her relationship with the king, and they signed a deposition about it. Apparently, they'd questioned the queen about her relationship with the king and what was happening when Anne and the king retired at night. And Anne had said, "'How can I be a maid and sleep every night with the king?' When he comes to bed, he kisses me and takes me by the hand and bids me good night, sweetheart. And in the morning kisses me and bids me farewell, darling. Is not this enough? But as historian Ruth Warnick points out in her book on the marriage, which I'd highly recommend, it seems unlikely that Anne of Cleves would have been ignorant about the birds and bees and what was supposed to go on in the marital bed when it was her duty to provide the king with a son as quickly as possible. And surely Anne's mother would have prepared her daughter for her wedding night. So it just seems a little bit odd. Anne's consent to an inquiry into the validity of her marriage was sought and a double convocation presided over by Archbishop Thomas Cramner met at the Chapter House of St Peter's Church in Westminster from the 7th of July. There, the King's letters of commission under the great seal addressed to the archbishops and clergy were read and Stephen Gardner, Bishop of Winchester, explained the causes of the nullity of the marriage of the King and Lady Anne of Cleves in a lucid speech. Convocation was convinced that there were grounds for the annulment, and after their ruling, councillors were sent to visit Anne, who was at Richmond, on the 11th of July 1540 to obtain her agreement to the annulment. 
and gave them a written agreement and she also wrote a letter to the king. Was told by diverse of the council of the doubts concerning their marriage and how petition was made that the same might be examined by the clergy, consented to this. Though the case must needs be hard and sorrowful for the great love she bears to his most noble person, yet having more regard to God and his truth than to any worldly affection, she accepts the judgment, asks the king to take her as one of his most humble servants and so to determine of her as she may sometimes have the fruition of his presence. The lords and others of his council now with her have put her in comfort thereof and that the king will take her as his sister. Richmond, the 11th of July, 32nd year of Henry VIII. Subscribed, your majesty's most humble sister and servant, Anne, daughter of Cleves. And on the 12th of July, the same day that Parliament announced Anne's agreement to the annulment, Henry VIII replied to his former wife, Right, dear, and right, entirely beloved sister, by the relation of the Lord Master, Lord Privy Seal, and others of our council lately addressed unto you. We perceive the continuance of your conformity, which before was reported, and by your letters is F. Soon's testified. We take your wise and honourable proceedings therein in most thankful part, as it is done in respect of God and his truth. And continuing your conformity, you shall find us a perfect friend, content to repute you as our dearest sister. We shall, within five or six days, when our Parliament ends, determine your state after such honourable sort as you shall have good cause to be content. We minding to endow you with £4,000 of yearly revenue. We have appointed you two houses, that at Richmond where you now lie, and the other at Bletchingley, not far from London, that you may be near us and, as you desire, able to repair to our court to see us as we shall repair to you. When Parliament ends, we shall, in passing, see and speak with you, and you shall more largely see what a friend you and your friends have of us. Requires her to be quiet and merry. Westminster, 12th of July, 32nd year of Henry VIII. Thus subscribed, your loving brother and friend, H.R. Anne responded favourably, thanking the king and giving him a ring for a token. She later sent him the ring delivered unto her at their pretensed marriage, desiring that it might be broken in pieces as a thing which she knew of no force or value. Now that's, she's obviously referring to the wedding ring there and how very sad her words there that uh, it was about their pretensed marriage and it should be broken into pieces because it held no value. That just seems so sad. But Henry must have been so relieved that his fourth wife was not going to cause him any trouble. She was not opposing any of what was happening. She was just uh, accepting the situation. And Anne was rewarded uh, for her submission by, as I've just said, Henry mentioned it in his letter to her, by being granted Bletchingley Manor and Richmond Palace. She was also granted a house in Lewis and also granted the the lease of Hever Castle, the former Berlin family home, and also given various jewels, plates, uh, hangings, uh, furniture, sorry, plate, not plates, hangings and furniture. And she would also have precedence over all ladies in England after the Queen and the King's children, and she'd be known as the King's sister. Anne went on to have a very good relationship with the king, spending New Year 1541 at Hampton Court Palace with Henry and Queen Catherine. And she also had good relationships with his children, Mary, Elizabeth and Edward. Anne died on the 6th of July 1557, having outlived the king, all his other wives and her stepson, Edward VI. And she was buried in Westminster Abbey. 
I find Anne of Cleves a fascinating figure. I think uh, she's become my uh, second favourite of the uh, six wives of King Henry VIII. I just find her story so very interesting. And the fact that she was so beloved by so many people, she must have been such a lovely lady. So that's what happened on this day in Tudor history. Thank you for joining me. You can subscribe round about there by clicking there. Uh, subscribe to this channel. You can hit the bell to be notified as videos go live. Please do uh, consider giving me a like. The bells are ringing out for you to uh, like this video. Uh, but uh, rest assured, I'll be back tomorrow with another Tudor history goodie for you. See you then. Bye bye.